First, uh, in reaction to, I think, the, the very important remarks that we've just heard, I'm going to start out with a plea, uh, which I, I think that's the word that Professor Wright used earlier. Uh, and it's also something of a broken record for me, although I don't get out as much as, as Professor Schur does. But uh, forgive me, uh, I, I, I make these comments uh, not wearing rose-colored glasses, but I just have to start out. Uh, and then I'll try to give some more reasoned reflection on, on the comments made by Professor uh, uh, Shun and Ambassador Bader. Before I do that, though, let me just say how much I've appreciated uh, the role that both Ambassador Bader and uh, Professor Shun uh, have played, not just today, but uh, throughout their, their careers, in honestly appraising the state of the U.S.-China relationship, uh, while also in their individual ways, uh, Jeff, as a, as a consummate professional diplomat par excellence, and, and Professor Shun as a public intellectual, uh, working for a better uh, mutual understanding uh, between the, the US and China. Uh, I valued the message in, in, uh, in, in Ambassador Bader's terrific book on, uh, on Obama and China, uh, which ends uh, with uh, comments on, on uh, his observation that it's a challenge uh, American presidents have uh, to, to strike uh, the right balance between maintaining US strength and watchfulness but also be, being wary of falling into the classic security dilemma wherein each side sees uh, hostile intent in the other's growing capabilities. And Professor Shun, per, throughout his career, has, has at times uh, very boldly called on his own country uh, to understand the undesirable consequences of its own actions in, in shaping its security environment, both on the North Korean issue as well as the South China Sea, is advocating uh, working with the United States to allay uh, the two sides' mutual concerns. But uh, despite the wisdom of, of, of people like uh, Ambassador Bader and, and Professor Shun on the two sides, I don't think that I'm unusual in seeing uh, a very uh, negative uh, and depressing and troubling trend in the US-China relationship. As someone whose coming of age coincided with really an efflorescence of US-China relations in the 1980s, I'm, I'm frustrated by this trend, which I think is driven by, by both sides and has been gaining momentum uh, for many years. And it's expressed in terms of very nar negative narratives uh, and couched in fables and historically deterministic metaphors uh, on both sides. More than four decades ago, the US and China began a very productive engagement that uh, had both mutual uh, benefits, regional benefits and global benefits. Uh, before the US and China were, uh, when they were estranged, uh, China was isolated, it was fearful, and it was disruptive. It was a much less secure world. The US and China fought each other in Vietnam not very long after we fought each other in, uh, in Korea. Uh, the Asia-Pacific was divided, and, and regimes on, on both sides of the Cold War ideological divide were authoritarian. The last four decades have seen regional integration, both economic and uh, multilateral. Governments across Asia have become steadily more democratic, and no longer isolated, the Chinese people are seeing a greater personal prosperity and uh, also greater security uh, from their own uh, national politics. Uh, China is also uh, now, uh, in, according to PPP measures, the world's largest economy. And when I got to China in the 80s, uh, per capita GDP was about $300. Now it's 8,000. So all of that's uh, familiar to uh, all of you. Uh, there have been four decades of positive gains on the balance sheet for both sides. But suddenly, I think we're at a point, uh, I think a lot sooner than either the United States or China had ever imagined, when uh, China sees itself as a global power, uh, like the United States, comparable to the United States, although comprehensively it recognizes it's weaker. And the United States has sees China as a near peer com competitor. The prevailing language coming out of China presents uh, a very negative narrative of US-China relations that is essentially a story of US efforts to contain it rather than a story of the benefits of US-China uh, engagement and cooperation. I apologize, Clay told me I had more time, so I'm gonna go on. Yeah, <laughs> so. Um, and uh, 
This is a not so surprising because on the U.S. side, references to China are increasingly framed in terms of threats to U.S. interests in multiple spheres. I won't go on uh, to talk about the reasons for this, but certainly domestic politics is a, fa is a factor uh, in the United States right now. On the Chinese side, uh, uh, you have uh, you have a regime that is, is, is facing the challenge of performing surgery on a, or maybe an exorcism on an unhealthy and a debauched uh, economic system, trying to do that without killing it. Or maybe it's just the loud decibel level that we allow the, the uh, precautionary voices of both of our militaries. I'll just, I would just say that while history is dominated by the dramas of conflict, whether we're talking about the Thucydides trap or, or Yishan Bunung, Chang uh, a mountain cannot hold two tigers as, as inevitable. Those frames should not be given deterministic weight. We're both countries capable of great rationality uh, and pragmatism. And I fear, I worry, and a lot of others do that we're marching toward folly. So now a few words on, on Ambassador Bader's discussion and, and then uh, Professor Shun. On Ambassador Bader, uh, his comments raised the question for me is, even though he, he began to answer it, uh, what is the way forward for a, a stable U.S.-China relationship, uh, given all the challenges he mentioned? Uh, looking at the Asia-Pacific, American efforts there, I think, to um, enforce international law and also allay the concerns of our, 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 uh, our partners and our allies, which we uh, do most obviously using military tools. I think that feeds uh, China's containment narrative and, and hypernationalism in, inside China. At the same time, uh, our efforts to allay our regional partners' concerns may also embolden them to press their claims using uh, more assertive uh, uh, approaches, part particularly in light of China's strong opposition uh, to the Philippine arbitration. And even in that case, um, we have to worry because there's an upcoming election in the Philippines. Finally, even as we try to allay our, our regional partners' concerns, uh, and the strengthened bilateral ties between the U.S. and those partners can actually, I worry, uh, be corrosive for regional, uh, regionally based solutions uh, to uh, these regional problems like the South China Sea. Uh, so, so going back to my earlier question about how to manage the U.S.-China relationship, how do, we, how do we go beyond enforcement? How do we go beyond de deterrence? Is it enough to try to simultaneously uh, build some mechanisms for communication, for, for crisis management, take some steps for co toward cooperative security, like the upcoming and much criticized uh, RIMPAC, uh, Rim of the Pacific exercises, in which China will take part with the United States? So where do we, where do we go? And, and this brings me to uh, what I heard today Professor Shun saying. His, his comments actually brought to mind uh, some earlier proposals that he had made. Um, and let me just, just point to one. Um, he, a number of years ago, uh, had suggested that uh, the U.S. and China put forward a new communique of sorts to help govern the relationship. Um, that's not a new idea. But, uh, in, and on the U.S. side, I think uh, a diplomat Richard Holbrook had proposed something like that in, uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, Bob Zellick, also as president of the World Bank, uh, made similar proposal, and others have proposed this more recently. But some kind of agreement that would help govern uh, bilateral behavior in order to try uh, to avoid triggering conflict along obvious fault lines uh, and, uh, and provide a basis for cooperation that uh, would, uh, anyway, some sort of grand agreement that would support mutual efforts at, at strategic restraint. So I, I wonder uh, what uh, the, our two speakers think might be possible uh, as a way forward. I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs>